Good morning, Village. How are we feeling today? Oh, nice. Let's stand up. We've got uh, Mackenzie, Will, and William here today, and we are ready to worship in the house. Uh, if you're joining us online, we hope that you are moving and grooving on the couch. So let's try it. Here we go. Well, it all comes down to this. What you require of me, love my neighbor as myself, and you above all things. Act justly, act justly, love mercy, walk humbly with you, God. To be your hands and feet, good news to all the world. Oh, the truth will set us free. Walk up, act justly, love mercy, love mercy. Walk humbly with you, God. It all things in all. morning to dancing it's closer and closer the kingdom of heaven it's beauty for ashes it's morning to dancing it's closer and closer the kingdom of heaven and years from now we'll see the fruit the fruit our hands have Faith just like a seed, the only way, the only way it grows. Act justly, act justly, the mercy, walk humbly with you. I think what I love about that song, we all know that verse from Micah, right? And what it tells us is that we learn on the playground everything should be fair in life, you know? If they take the ball, you need to share the ball. If they're out of bounds, they're out of the game. And God says, you know, not everything's fair. We need to dress everything in humility and mercy. And yes, there is an element of justice, but we should also just love mercy. So the village is a place all about love. We believe that uh, love does not have any conditions and that God gives us unconditional love. So we're going to sing a Red Rock song called Love Changes Everything. I hope you'll sing with me. I see his body breaking. I see his fingers bleeding. I see the darkness tremble at the ground below his feet. And in the darkest hours, well, there on Calvary, well, he was sweetly broken, broken beautifully. Broken beautifully. Here we go. So come, come on into the, the waters. Come let the broken sing. Come all your sons and daughters. His love changes everything. Come when the fear is fighting. You're finding the risen King. Come on and let the light in. Your love changes everything. Sing with me when the heavens, and when the heavens opened, I saw the sins of men. 
Come a crown of glory as you died and rose again. And in the darkest hours, and in the valley low, well, I will fear no evil, because you'll never let me go. everything so come when the fear is hiding you're finding the risen king come on and let the light in your love changes everything your love your love your love changes everything your love your love your love changes everything and none can overcome when death has lost its sting because your love your love And in the darkest hours, in the valley low, and in the valley low, I will fear no evil, I will fear no evil, because you'll never let me go. everything so come when the fear is fighting you're finding the risen king come on and let the light in your love changes everything your love your love your love changes everything your love your love your love changes everything and none can overcome when death has lost its sting your love your love Everything. Your love, your love, your love changes everything. Your love, your love, your love changes everything. And none can overcome when death has lost its sting. Your love, your love, your love changes everything. Amen. Well, we always want to make time for loving each other, so I hope you turn to your neighbor, and if there's someone in front or behind that you don't know, figure out who they are. Say hello and figure out how their week was. Hi, good to meet you, Matt. Hey, thank you so much. You guys are doing great. All right. Well, we hope that you can take a seat. We've got our giving slide up. We want to be a generous church. Uh, we are small but mighty, and we love the village. We love that this is a place we can come every Sunday. So I encourage you as we start a new school year to think about what is your rhythm of giving? What makes sense to you? Uh, Ray is so sweet. He never will pressure anybody to give. But I will. No, I'm just kidding. Uh, so whatever that makes sense for y'all, uh, we always have people that are willing to help you do that. And we've got the QR code up on the screen. But most importantly, we want to take a second on Sundays to just be still. You know, that whole be still and know that I'm God thing, it requires you to be still. And I love this song uh, by United Pursuit called Not In A Hurry. So here at The Village, we know everyone's on a different faith journey. And if you just need time to breathe or time to sit and think or if you need time to pray, um, or if you need time to be in worship with us, this is an opportunity to do that. So take a deep breath, and we hope that you'll uh, be with us in this moment.
Lord, I don't want to rush on ahead in my own strength when you're right here. Lord, I don't want to rush on ahead in my own strength when you're right here. I'm not in a hurry when it comes to your spirit, when it comes to your presence, when it comes to your voice. I'm learning to listen just to rest in your nearness. I'm starting to notice you are speaking. you feel I want to see what you see Lord I I want to love like you I want to feel what you feel I want to see what you see I'm not in a hurry when it comes to your spirit when it comes to your presence when it comes to your voice, I'm learning to listen, just to rest in your nearness. I'm starting to notice you are speaking. Lord, we want to be a place where people can come and find rest. We want to be a place where we love mercy, where we act justly, and we walk humbly. We want to be a place where love looks different and changes every single thing. Be with these people today that are joining us online and here in Hapeville, Georgia, and bless the message that Pastor Stan is going to bring us right now. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, I'm excited to hear from our good friend Stan. I think he's here. Uh, will y'all welcome him and Pastor Ray? Yeah, I don't. I don't know if Stan's here. He, I don't see him. All right, Marshall, you come up and preach. Come on up. Not really. Not really. Stan's in the lobby. I think he'll be up in a minute. Welcome everybody. Well, there you are. I didn't see you here. Good to see you. I thought you were out there. Thank you. 
I want to read a parable to you. Do you guys all have your phone? Remember when we used to say, do you have your Bible? Now we say, do you have your phone? Turn, if you have Bible Gateway or something like that, I would love for you to read this text with me as I read it. It's found in Matthew 20. From the parables of Jesus, and the parable's called several things, but uh, most familiar to me is the parable of the laborers in the vineyard. And it's found in Matthew 20. I think I'm reading from the New Revised Standard Version. You can read from any translation. Sometimes it's nice when somebody's reading from a translation to read from another one. You can kind of contrast and get fuller meaning. Before I, before I do that, while you're looking for Matthew 20 there in your app, I, I was talking to Ray this morning about the way I read Scripture. And, of course, I've had a relationship with Scripture for 55 years, different relationship. But in ministry, I've certainly had an important vocational relationship with, with Scripture. One of the challenges of ministry is, for those of us who have a vocational relationship with Scripture, sometimes, I don't know if you've done this, you can go a year, two years, three years, and realize I, I've, I've kind of not lost, but I've become distant in my own personal relationship with our sacred text. I'm always reading it, looking for sermons, and reading it professionally, and trying to figure out how it advantages people. Periodically, and it happened to me just a few months ago, I realized, you know, it's been a while since I've just sat down and read scripture devotionally for myself. And so I, I pulled up a new translation that I hadn't read um, by a guy f uh, named David Bentley Hart. His translation of the New Testament is very brilliant. I love David Bentley Hart. You've done it, Alejandro. Brilliant. And so I've just started reading. Well, I started with the parables. And I realized there's three ways that I read uh, sacred literature, our biblical text, and really specific to the life of Jesus, and even more specific to his... You want me to stay with this? All right, I'll, what do you say, Lewis? Okay, good now, all right. Well, three ways, forgive the interruption there, three ways that I, I read the text. The, the first is, I read the text, and this is the way I was trained, and Ray, you'll remember this training. I was trained to read the text believing that all those hundreds of years ago when it was written, God had divinely imbued and embedded one meaning in that text. And Marshall, I was responsible as an exegete. That was the fancy word we learned, exegete. It means to get out of, to mine from something what is, what is there. And in the conservative Christian church, which I grew up in, the idea was that God has put in one single meaning in that text, and it is our responsibility in whatever culture and whatever epoch of time that we find ourselves located, we have to transcend our location, our social location, cultural location, preferential location, geographical location. We have to transcend all of our locations, put them down, and find the original meaning that God put in the text. And that meaning was the truth. And every denomination had their interpretation of what that original intent and meaning was. Now, I no longer believe that somewhere God constitutionally put one idea in every text that we are responsible to mine good doctrine from, and good doctrine depends on finding that one meaning. I, I don't believe that. But I still personally think it's advantageous for me to understand the context in which something was written. I think it's wonderful to understand the context, not just the geographical and cultural context in which Jesus spoke, but to even understand the context of his own life and where he was coming from and what he was feeling and what the text meant to him. I'm one of those people, Nashvilleian, pastored there for 28 years, and I believe me, I have heard 
lots of songwriters when I say, hey, where'd that song come from? What's it, you know, what's it mean? Most songwriters, especially the new ones, say, I'm not going to tell you. You tell me what it means. It means what it means to you. And I, I can appreciate the brilliance of that, but I, I've got to say, I find my own meanings more rich when I understand where a song came from for a writer or, or a poem. So I do still read a text wondering what was the original intent and idea and context for the author. Second way I read a text is, is, a, is a way that I've learned as I've, as I've evolved into a more progressive liberal interpretation of Christianity and religion and spirituality. And I think it's incredibly meaningful, and I think it has its ditch, just like the conservative side has its ditch, and you can take it too far. But I, I think we learned this from our Jewish forebears. They called it midrash, and it was their, not tendency, but it was their desire and, and really their responsibility to sit with a text and to bring something that I didn't learn in conservative circles, but they believed that a text invited creativity and imagination and that we should bring moral imagination and, and thoughtful creativity, poetic creativity to a text, believing that, that a text is living and vibrant, and it's not just bound and ball and chain to an original meaning, but while it might mean that, it could mean many things, and it could expand and grow in ways in your life that it, it, it might not ever expand and grow and be relevant in another life. And that doesn't diminish the text, and it's not being willy-nilly with the text. It's actually lifting the text up and saying it's even bigger than we thought before. So I, I do try to read a text creative and imaginatively, but with the parables, like the one I'm about to read to you, and I think this is germane to my life writ large in a lot of ways. But. I find, as I'm just reading the text devotionally, the most meaningful way for me to read the text is to read it as a child. And I think most text, and I think especially the words of Jesus, were such that your best bet, not your only bet, but your best bet, or at least the place to lead, is just to read it the way you would have read it when you were in second grade. Because on the surface of most of these parables, there's some really plain meanings that almost work a preacher out of their job. Because the text is so simple, you can just, if we did nothing more today but say, we are going to read this text together, sit thoughtfully with it for a minute, let it rest on our heart, and then commit to one another that we will just ruminate through the week. That would be a good exercise. This is one of those texts. And because I still have a job and still res feel responsible to that job, I'm going to give a sermon about it a little bit after I read the text. But you might not know a whole lot more after my sermon than you did than when we read the text. So then you're sitting there saying, well, just read the text and let's go to lunch. Well, I'm too much of a narcissist to do that. So let's read the word of the Lord together. Just kidding. Matthew 20, verse 1. For the kingdom of heaven is like a landowner who went out early in the morning to hire laborers for his vineyard. Verse 2. After the landowner agreed with the laborers on the sum of a denarius for the day. If you work a full day, I give you a denarius. After the agreement was made, he sent them into the vineyard. When he went out about nine o'clock, I assume one, two, three hours into the day, he saw others standing idle in the marketplace. And he said to those who were standing idle, you also go into the vineyard and I'll pay you whatever is right. So the agreement was not settled specifically Except, if you'll trust me, I know you're going late, three hours late, but we'll settle on what's right. And they agreed, and they went. Verse 5, and I love the way Jesus tells this because a second grader can pick up on what's being said here, what's being set up. 
when he went out again about noon, three hours later, and then again about three o'clock, he did the same thing. And then he went out about five o'clock and he found others standing around and he said to them, why are you standing here idle all day? Now this is happening at five o'clock, an hour from the whistle blowing. They said to him, we're standing here idle all day because we're lazy and don't want to work. You see, if you did that with a second grade class, they'd be like, no, that's not what he said. And yet we can all feel that, can't we? We can hear that judgment, can't we? I've made that judgment. I've been judged by that judgment. He said to those at five o'clock, it's important to me to know. He didn't first say, do you want to work? He said, what's going on in your life? Why are you standing here idle all day? They said, because no one has hired us. He said, well, if that's the case, I will. You go into the vineyard. When evening came, the owner of the vineyard said to his manager, call the laborers and give them their pay, beginning with the last. Don't just pay everybody. Start with the ones who came in at 5 o'clock. Points being made here beginning with the last and then going to the first. When those hired about five o'clock came, each of them received a denarius. And when they received it, they grumbled. No, verse 10. Now, when the first came, when the first came, they thought they would receive more. So they resettled in their mind what they deserved when they saw the deal other people were getting. Anybody relate? They were happy with their car until their friend drove up in hers. Felt wonderful about their house until their friends bought a new one. You see what's happening here in the story? It's just, it's an expose on human nature. When the first came, they thought they would receive more, but each of them also received denarius. And when they received it, they grumbled against the landowner. And they said, these last worked only one hour, and you've made them equal to us who've borne the burden of the day and the scorching heat. Entitlement. But he replied to one of them, friend, that little line right there is, is brilliant on Jesus' part. He has a group of people. He has a group politic forming but Ray he won't enter into the group politic as the people are murmuring and building a consensus a group politic he says to one of them because it gets complex and skewed when the responsibility and the right diffuses to an entire group that then labels themselves Jesus does not enter the complexity and the impossibility of the warring politic. He stops, simplifies, and says, Bill, everybody, it's just you and me, Bill. Didn't we agree to this? I remember distinctly agreeing to this, and you were happy about it, Bill. E, he won't talk to the group. That's smart. It's very smart. He replied to one of them, friend, 
I, I didn't do you wrong. Did you not agree with me for a denarius? Take what belongs to you and go. I choose to give to this last the same as I give to you. Verse 15, the owner of the vineyard says, am I not allowed to do what I choose with what belongs to me? And then, and then this question, or are you envious because I'm generous? What's interesting is he doesn't say, or are you angry because I'm stingy? But that's what the guy is feeling. The guy is feeling angry because the owner of the vineyard has cheated him and is stingy. And the owner of the vineyard said, that's not what I'm doing at all. I didn't decide at the end of the day to cut into what I promised you. I decided at the end of the day to be generous to another human being. You're not really bothered by my stinginess towards you. You're bothered by my generosity to another. And I want to ask you a question. What is it about the joy and the happiness of another person that makes you sad? What is it about the benefit? What is it about the blessing? What is it about the happiness of another person that makes you feel less? Wow, what a question. Am I not allowed to do what I choose with what belongs to me? Or is it that you're envious because I'm generous? So the last will be first, and the first will be last. A few thoughts on fairness. I don't know when I wrote this, but it's been a few years now. But I could have written it this morning. From time to time, I remember her. I really never know what's going to provoke the memory. Sometimes she visits my dreams. Often she invades my waking thoughts. For some reason, she has never gone completely away in my life. This in spite of the fact the last time I actually saw her in person was over four decades ago. She of whom I speak was a classmate of mine. We were classmates throughout our early elementary school years, I think up to about fifth grade. I can see her now vividly in my mind's eye. I remember the sound of her voice. I remember the color of her hair. But most specifically, I remember her life was hard. It was very hard. And my life was much easier. I remember the few pieces of clothes that she wore. I remember how they were always dirty. I remember vividly that she smelled very bad. Looking back, understanding what I was seeing, I didn't know then but I know now she was malnourished. I remember her hair was thin, her eyes were deep set, her jaws were gaunt. I have distinct memories of one day being way out in the country for one reason or another. I think my dad and I had taken the truck out past the country. We lived three miles down a gravel road, but we had gone deep where the gravel ran out and it was just dirt. We were going down to a creek. I, I think I remember my dad was getting a load of gravel for concrete. And as we were driving in the country for one reason or another, I remember seeing her where I did not expect to see her in the yard of her home. A shanty that was so pitiful, I can see it right now. I was past the place where there were electric lines. It was past the place where people were supposed to live. We were country people. 
we, we always said we were so we lived so far out in the country we had to go toward town to hunt well she was way out past that and I remember seeing her in the yard of a shanty that was so pitiful it could scarcely be called a house and I remember through the window the roll down window of the truck seeing her and I remember her seeing me and I remember looking away because her shame, the embarrassment, I was seeing her in a place that she never wanted anybody to see her, and I felt it. I was probably in second grade. I remember feeling it. I remember, I, I can't remember who looked away first, but we both could not bear the weight of that moment, and we both looked away. And I can distinctly remember I felt lightheaded. We lived in a 950 square foot Jim Walter's home, if some of you older folks remember those, modular homes that you piece together. My dad's first car payment was more than our house payment. But I remember when dad built a 300 square foot addition and we went up to 1,200 square foot. I remember my brother and sister and I standing there in the living room, Ray, looking around thinking, what are we going to do with all this space? Poverty and riches are so relative to expectation of what you know. And on that day, a new level of relativity opened in my heart and mind as I saw where she lived. Even at school, breaks were hard for her to catch. There comes to my mind the specific memory, a specific memory of her, a story from her life, from my life with her. It came from our mid-elementary years. We were on our school's playground and for what must have been the hundredth time, there on the playground, she was not picked for one of the kickball teams. See, now I think this is what Jesus would want us to do with the text. I think he would tell a story like that, and it would connect us to our own stories. And as we told our stories and heard other people tell their stories, we realized as different as they are, we really all do share a story, don't we? We share it from different sides, from different angles. We experience it. You know, one has the tail of the elephant, the other the trunk, but it really is the same elephant. And when I read the parables of the vineyard, 40 years erase, 50 years erase, and I go back and I remember Esther. And I remember that day on the playground, as I, as I hear the fella stomp his foot and say unfair I think about fairness and I remember that day for what must have been the hundredth time when she was not picked for one of the kickball teams and I remember how always before for several years she always in that moment because nobody ever picked her we never knew if she was a good athlete or not. We just didn't want her on our team because she smelled so bad. She was so far down the pecking order. We didn't say that, and yet there were cruel games. I do remember the cruel games. You remember them? Somebody would touch her, and in order to relieve themselves of the burden of her, they would touch you, and they would say, you have her germ. They would call her name, you have her germs. And then she would have to, my God, she would have to watch a whole game centered around you have Esther's germs. Hmm. She had always accepted her fate. When she wasn't chosen, she always receded, disappeared, and watched the other kids play. But for whatever reason, on this particular day, this time the pain was too great the pain had built to an insufferable level and in that little single digit of years girl's heart as we picked ones moved on to play she couldn't stand it she stood up for herself and she blurted out it ain't fair I'll never forget it it ain't fair she said it quiet at first it ain't fair but by the time she said it the fourth time all of the sadness, the tears brimmed and spilled over her eyes and embittered her heart. 
as she screamed at us and raged, it ain't fair. It just ain't fair. I can still see her hollow brown eyes brimming with liquid pain as she exclaimed the truth about more than the moment, more than the game, and more than her impoverished fate. I saw her that day as she made a deeply truthful statement about life itself. It just ain't fair. And when I read the parable from Jesus, and it makes me think about Esther, I keep doing Midrash, and it makes me think about Janice Ian's song from 1975. Janice Ian burst on the scene with Society's Child in 1965. She was 15 years old when she wrote Society's Child, precocious kid. In 1975, she won a Grammy, nominated five times, won a Grammy for best song for this song. It was called At 17. It took her three months to write the song because she said it literally was a song about her life. She said, it was not her life at 17, it was her life between 12 and 14, but 17 fit poetically and melodically with the song. But the point remains the same. Janice Ian wrote in that Grammy award-winning song, I learned the truth at 17 that love was meant for beauty queens and high school girls with clear skin smiles who married young and then retired. The Valentines I never knew, the Friday night charades of youth, were spent on one more beautiful. At 17, I learned the truth. And those of us with ravaged faces, lacking in the social graces, desperately remained at home, inventing lovers on the phone, who called to say, come dance with me and murmured vague obscenities. It isn't all it seems at 17. She was of East European descent and had a name no one could pronounce, which gives context to the next line. A brown-eyed girl in hand-me-downs, whose name I never could pronounce, said, pity please the ones who serve they only get what they deserve. The rich relationed hometown queen marries into what she needs with a guarantee of company and haven for the elderly. So remember those who win the game, lose the love they sought to gain in debatures of quality and dubious integrity. Their small town eyes will gape at you in dull surprise when payment due exceeds accounts received at 17. So to those of us who knew the pain of Valentine's that never came and those whose names were never called when choosing sides for basketball, it was long ago and far away the world was younger than today when dreams were all they gave for free to ugly duckling girls like me. We all play the game and when we dare, we cheat ourselves at solitaire, inventing lovers on the phone, repenting other lives unknown who call and say, come dance with me and murmur vague obscenities to ugly girls like me at 17. And I reflect on Jesus' parable about fairness. And I reflect on Esther's life and the playground tantrum. And I, seeing Janice Ian's song in my head, and it takes me where I think Jesus would have maybe guessed it would take me as a good Jewish guy and those of us who love Scripture. I can't help but remember the words of the Jewish prophet Micah that to that playground, to that board ground, to that boardroom, to that, to that congressional seat, the prophet Micah said, God has already shown us what's good. God has shown us what's required of us. God has already shown us what is good in this world. And the first thing 
is to act toward others fairly. God's already given us the answer in the back of the book, right here in the front of the book. You don't even have to turn to the back of the book. It's right here. First thing, God has shown us what is good and what God wants from us. Joyce, he said, the, the first thing, whether you're a czar, a president, or the one charged with picking the kickball team, act justly, act fairly. The second thing that God has asked of us is interesting in its juxtaposition against that. Act justly and then love showing mercy. Wait a minute. Mercy is when I withhold punishment or obligation that is actually due. And Ray, Esther did not need mercy that day. Esther needed fairness. Because it is not fair that these are the only clothes you have because this is the only life you have and the only home you have and the only opportunity. It is not fair because you have a mother who not only doesn't have a wash, but a mother who has dealt with her despair with alcohol. It is not fair that that means every day of your elementary life you don't get to play the game. Now, in the simple algorithm and rubric of other third graders, you don't play the game because when we play, we bump into one another and we sweat and it makes you unbearable. But in the complex algorithm of life that seeks to understand more variables than the one on the surface, because the wise man said, with all of thy getting, make sure you get understanding, which is exactly what Brother Stephen Covey told us when he said, before you seek to be understood, seek to understand. And before you go to war with your enemy on the complex algorithm of fighting over this territory, before you go to war with your enemy, find the place where they weep and watch them in the place of their tears. Know them in their tears, not their power. Know them in their sadness, not their joy. Know them where they hurt, not where they have ease. Find them not at the border of this fought over place or this fought over territory. Find them at the place of their tears. And when you have seen your enemy in the place of their humanity and tears, you may not hold them as your enemy anymore. But in third grade, we didn't know. We just knew she smelled bad. And Micah said, in the middle of all of our church services, all of our stuff, Micah said, God's actually told us, and, and it wouldn't have taken... It wouldn't have taken a joint house of parliament in England. It wouldn't have taken a group of Nobel laureates. It wouldn't have taken the United Nations. It wouldn't have taken a scholarly group of people. You could have sat down with a second grade class and a little girl Esther in that class. You could have sat down there and God could have said, I want to tell you kids what I need from you. I want to tell you what would be a good life is if you start by acting fairly and then I think God would have looked at us the way Jesus would have looked at us and said now that does beg the question what do we mean by fair doesn't it and that's a fair thing to sit back and tell a story and say let's discuss that because maybe it's not as simple as we've surmised this is what I'd like you to do I'd like you to, I'd like you to act fairly to other people but then I would also like you, he didn't say act mercifully. He actually said, I'd, I'd love for you to love mercy. You see, you act in ways that sometimes you have to get a hold of your emotions. Says, this isn't what I feel, but I know this is the right thing to do. He said, do that with fairness. But when it comes to mercy, this relieving of another, people, another person's burden, maybe even one they deserve, this punishment that you withhold to show love, 
I don't want you just to be merciful. This is about you now. I want you to love mercy. Because if he said, I want you to do mercy, Ray, he's saying, I want you to do mercy for their sake. But when he says, I want you to love mercy, he's saying, this is more than just for them. I want this for you. It would be to your great advantage to move from the person who is so exacting that they always have to settle the account, especially when it's the account settled in their favor, especially when it's correcting the wrong done to them. I want you to be the person that so finds internal peace that you not only can release people from debt, but when you see the relief in them, you feel joy and you love the giving of mercy. Wow. Well, that's a lot. And then, and this clears the whole thing up for me in a really muddy sort of way. If you'll start trying to figure out what's fair for that little girl and then do that with every person you ever meet and then when life doesn't exactly go your way and wrongs have been committed against you and debts are being held against you debts aren't being paid debitures undone Janice Ian saying that you who are concerned with fairness for others, when life is not exactly fair towards you, your response is to give mercy. And then the really brilliant line of Micah, capturing the heart of God, is then, is then walk humbly. Because Marshall, figuring out what's fair for that little girl and these two nations warring with that piece of property and boardrooms and what CEOs ought to make and frontline workers ought to make and what unions are saying and capitalists are saying, figuring all of that stuff out, figuring out where to give fairness, figuring out where to love mercy and when to stand up for yourself and not set yourself up to be abused. Figuring the complexity of all that out is not a simple X plus Y equals Z. It is an algorithm of such complexity that you should back off from your best attempt at fairness and mercy and be humble because it's a complex matter. Because, because walking a mile in another person's shoes is an oversimplification. Because to actually be able to figure out what is fairness and what is mercy, to actually figure out the algorithm, the complexity of your relationship to them requires this underbelly of humility that opens you to God and says, I'm just going to have to go with a gut here and I would love some guidance on what to do. Because this is not going to be reduced to a mathematical formula and a percentage of tax. It's just not going to be. I need a transformed heart. I need a transformed heart that has the capacity to feel what that little girl. I'll tell you about her. She became very mean. Mark, she got mean after that. We only knew, we then knew her the later years as really mean. I can't tell you how many times she got set in the corner and got in trouble for hitting at school. I can't tell you how many times in meeting out fairness and justice to that mean little girl, overworked teachers and tired principals just judged her on an X plus Y equals Z. Humility. There's so much so much here, but I, I think I'll, I'll, I'll close with this, and I think these are the big questions for me, and I think these are the things that have been helpful to me. Two, two stories from the life of Jesus, I think, really clear this up. The first, I just read the parable of the vineyard. A 
at the beginning of the day, the parable says the vineyard owner looked at a man standing in the marketplace, and, and the parable is consistent. Everybody who got called to the field, joy they had been in the marketplace. Well, when you look at the context, this is why you should know the context, the marketplace was the employment line. People went to the marketplace either to purchase, sell, or find a job, or to hire workers. Everybody who got sent to the vineyard that day were in the marketplace. The first people who were hired were in the marketplace, and the vineyard owner went up to them and said, you want to work? And they said, you better believe we do. Wouldn't be here if we didn't. How's a denarius sound? Sounds good to us. And they got in their car at the dealership, and they said, this is a fine Oldsmobile. And they drove off in their nice Oldsmobile, and they said, this is great. Nine o'clock, 12 o'clock, three o'clock, the guy goes back to the marketplace and he finds people standing idly there with nothing to do. Not lazily there, idly there, presumably there because they want to work. And he says, you want to work? And they said, yes. No half the day is gone. He said, would it be okay if we settle up at the end? They said, fair enough. Half to, we'll take a half day if we can get it. And he said, we'll settle up later. And they said, thank you. And then the fellows, five o'clock, same thing. And at the end of the day, the story's clear. The manager of the vineyard pays the, everybody a denarius, and the, and the first guys say this. They said, you cheated us. You should have given us more. They didn't make the argument that the guys that got paid and the gals that got paid at 5 o'clock got paid too much. They made the argument, we, don't, we didn't get enough. And, and this is what they said, and this is the assumption that I've made so many times in my oversimplified equation for fairness. They said, we have been out there in the heat, working our backsides off, and these guys just been standing around all day doing nothing. And here's what the manager or the owner of the vineyard, Gene, could have said to them. He could have said there was a time when your perspective on working hard today was pleasing to you. There was a time when your perspective on working hard today and getting paid a denarius sounded really good to you. But when you compared your deal to another person's deal, all of a sudden your deal didn't start looking as good as, didn't start feeling as good as it once felt. And, and there are two parts of that that are really, really wrong. The first and maybe the most wrong is you have assumed something about these folk who came at five. Your assumption is that they are lazy, no goods, who don't want to work. And while they were pitching pennies and playing marbles, somebody else to give them a handout, you were out there. The manager of the vineyard could have looked at Bill, the guy he talked to, and said, Bill, that assumption is wrong. They weren't pitching pennies. They were standing in an employment line, wringing their hands and sweating bullets, Daryl, wondering, how are we going to feed our kids? And you thought they were getting away with something and you were being punished. Two things. They weren't getting away with anything. They were suffering. 
something else. You weren't suffering. You were doing something that once gave you joy until you compared it to somebody else. In the 12-step world, you know what they call that? When we are talking about our sobriety and we start doing that kind of stuff, Ethan, they look at, we look at one another and we say, stay in your own dadgum hula hoop. Because when you get out of your hula hoop, everything goes screwy. The father sits down beside the elder brother and he says, son, why aren't you at your younger brother's party? And the elder brother, who presumably was happy at home until the prodigal came home and got a party, the elder brother on his hips and he looks at his father. And again, just like the guys that didn't say, you paid the ones who came in at 5 o'clock too much, the elder brother never said, you shouldn't have thrown a party for my younger brother. But when he saw the party for the younger brother, he forgot the party that had been his entire life. And he looked at the father and he didn't say, you shouldn't have thrown a party for him. He said, you've never thrown a party for me. And the father said, well, there's a problem, isn't it? Because your whole life has been a party, because everything I've ever had has been yours. But did you hear what the elder brother said? See, this is what happens when you get out of your hula hoop and you start comparing yourself. That's why we have to walk humbly. To walk humbly means you recognize the complexity of your life and know you can't possibly compare your situation to another person's situation. You can't walk a mile in their shoe. You'd have to walk every step they've ever taken and had their feet because you're looking at their Gucci shoes, forgetting and not knowing that they've got gout underneath those Gucci shoes that makes them want to die. But you didn't see that. The elder brother looks at the father and says two things, and they're both a lie, and it happens when you get out of your hula hoop. The elder brother looked at the father and said, this kid comes home after spending his money on prostitutes and high living. Did you know in the prodigal story, not one thing has been said about prostitutes until that moment? The father, Ray, could have looked at the elder brother and said, wait, wait back up. Who said anything about prostitutes? Only thing I've heard from him was he was knee deep in mud and the guy wouldn't let him eat the food he was feeding the pigs. Did he say something to you about prostitutes? No, I, I just, but I figured that's, oh, that's the fantasy you were building in your mind about him that probably says more about you than the one you're judging. And he says, well, I just figured he's been out there living with prostitutes, spending y'all's money on high life. The father could have looked at him and said, son, your brother was starving to death and suffering. Because fairness and the love of mercy and humility seeks to understand before it judges. And after understanding, there's no judgment left. It looks down from a cross and says, forgive them. And all of heaven says, why? And it says, they don't know what they're doing. You've got to be kidding me. And then the elder brother says, he's been out there with prostitutes, and I've been slave." He literally uses the word, I've been slaving for you my whole life. And the father's heart breaks, and he looks at his boy, and he says, that's what this has been to you? Your whole life's been a party. And the son says, well, I didn't really see it as slavery until I compared myself, until he drove up with his Cadillac. I like my Oldsmobile. So, I guess the lesson of Jesus is not a perfect lesson on how to treat others fairly, and it's not a perfect lesson on when to give mercy. I think it's kind of like the serenity prayer. Give me the peace to accept the things I can't change. Give me our, the strength to change the things I can. But more than that, give me the wisdom to know the difference. I don't know why we call that the serenity prayer. It's really the wisdom prayer. I want serenity to accept what I can't change. I want strength to change, courage to change the things I can. But really, I want wisdom to know the difference. And I think here is act fairly, love mercy, 
Think about what it means to be fair with Esther. Think about what it means to be merciful to those you think haven't been fair to you. Think about what it means to be in the younger brother's life. Don't fantasize about the pennies they've been shooting and the marbles they've been playing. Try to understand their circumstance before you make judgment. 99% of the time, you won't want to make judgment. And when you find out about the gout that's crippling their feet, you'll know that it's not about the Gucci's they have versus the Reeboks you have. You'll realize the complexity, and you'll realize we're all in this together, and you'll eventually love giving mercy because you'll know how much you need mercy too, and we'll just be humble together. And wouldn't that do a lot if we lived that way as neighbors and nations and churches? Isn't that brilliance from the life of Jesus? Well, let's settle our hearts. Let's close our eyes and just still our hearts now for a minute and let some of that sink in because there certainly are no answers, but maybe we'll walk away today with better questions, and maybe that's the point anyway, just better questions. God, our creator, the one who underlies all of this with love, let us think better thoughts about fairness. Let us be transformed until we love the giving and the dispensing of mercy. And above all, grant us the wisdom of humility that recognize the complexity, the multivariable nature of this algorithm called society and community and lives together. Forgive us for the judgments we've made about their prostitutes and riotous living and their laziness and not wanting to work. Forgive us for the overestimations of what we deserve and the underestimations of what they deserve. Forgive us for the us and they-ness of our hearts, the us and them-ness, this dividing line, this self-righteousness. And above all else, may we really enjoy our Reeboks and Oldsmobile in our little Jim Walter home. May we do less comparing it to the mansions on paved roads, and may we do more contrasting it to the shanties down the dirt roads. May we be a just people, a merciful people, and above all, a humble people as we consider these wise thoughts from this parable of Jesus. We pray this in Christ's name. And everybody said amen. Amen. That's enough to think about this week, isn't it? I'm done.